We are going to be talking this afternoon about truth and post-truth and whether basically anything really matters anymore, whether there is such a thing as truth. I'll even be discussing what pre-truth might be, whether or not we've ever obtained absolute truth. So this is going to be a little bit philosophical, <clears throat> also a little bit political, because post-truth is a it's an idea that's usually associated with day-to-day -day politics. But let's start off with a few sort of just essential definitions. Post-truth was the word of the year for the Oxford English Dictionary in 2016. 2016, of course, was the year in which uh, Brexit happened. It was also the year in which Donald Trump won the presidency. And the idea of post-truth is that these two events happened through appeals to emotion rather than a, uh, argumentation predicated on on facts. So in other words, it's supposedly this notion that that feelings trump facts and that expertise is therefore somewhat denigrated at the altar of what people have in their hearts. OK, so here's the specific definition that the uh, Oxford English Dictionary came up with. Uh, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Now, we would always encourage students in essays and interviews to always to move beyond dictionary de definitions. Dictionary definitions are fine, but they're tremendously generic, right? Uh, you know, a dictionary definition is designed for a very broad audience. And we'd love to know a bit about what you think the concept means. So here are a few of my thoughts on it and how it could be considered. But of course, have a think about it for yourself. Let me know how you feel about post-truth. Um, perhaps a good way of discussing the idea is through examples. So sometimes these complex concepts are more easily understood if we talk through illustrations. Perhaps my favourite illustration is this man, Sean Spicer. He was Donald Trump's first press secretary. And he got embroiled in an argument early doors when uh, he took over as the press secretary because of a big fight about how big the crowds were at President Trump's inauguration. And Spicer got properly irate with journalists who kept pointing out that fairly objectively, there were fewer people at Donald Trump's inauguration than Barack Obama's inauguration. Now, Sean Spicer was no doubt just channeling the grievance of his boss, Donald Trump, who was clearly perturbed by the idea that he may have had fewer people attend his inauguration than his predecessor. And one way that a commentator described Sean Spicer's approach to this was that he had alternative facts. Now, that particular description came from a lady called Kellyanne Conway, who was a very close supporter and longtime advisor to Donald Trump. So what she said was that Sean Spicer wasn't wrong, but he had alternative facts. OK, <laughs> now, to my mind, alternative facts means that he is wrong. He is objectively incorrect in his statement that Donald Trump had a larger audience at his inauguration. And so this, to my mind, is a pretty clear example of post-truth, that through sheer force of will, Donald Trump and Sean Spicer and Kellyanne Conway will hypnotize us into thinking that more people turned up to Donald Trump's inauguration, even though evidence, data, seems to suggest quite strongly that that's not the case. OK, but I think we can go deeper into the weeds of post-truth. It also has, of course, quite contemporary political significance. The big lie, as it's been called by both sides in the American presidential election. So Donald Trump thinks it's a big lie that people haven't acknowledged his supposed victory in the 2020 presidential election. And everyone opposing Donald Trump thinks it's a big lie that he keeps saying that he actually won the 2020 presidential election. And it's a fight that they are still going on about to the extent that they are still recounting ballots in Arizona as we speak. Uh, and Donald Trump is still applying pressure on people that supposedly don't believe his version of the truth. Now, this is really fascinating. It begs all sorts of psychological questions. Does Donald Trump actually genuinely believe what he's saying? We simply don't know. A recent book by Michael Wolff suggests that he is, quote, off his rocker 
that he is deluded, perhaps, that he maybe does believe what he's saying, even though it is far removed from everyone else's perception of reality, Trump still believes it. So to a non-trivial sense, it is his reality. And because he has so many followers, it becomes their reality by extension as well. And it all gets a little bit sort of confusing and and perception oriented. Another very famous example of post-truth, and this time I would argue a little bit more sophisticated, is this infamous red bus that uh, made its way around the UK in the uh, before the in the referendum on Brexit in 2016, and it made a very bold claim on the side that we uh, send the EU 50 to 350 million pounds a week, and we should spend it on our NHS instead. Now, pretty much everyone at the time and subsequently knew that this wasn't accurate. It wasn't technically wrong. The EU did receive £350 million on average per week from the United Kingdom. But as a result of a rebate, a significant chunk of that then came back. So the the gross amount that Britain gave to the EU was £350 million a week, but the net amount was substantially less than that. Everyone basically knew that. So what this bus was doing was arguably misleading people. But frankly, it wasn't misleading many people. It was pretty obvious to everyone that was paying attention to this that what was on the side of the bus was a bit tricksy and not true. So kind of everyone bought into the lie. And this is a really fascinating point about post-truth. For it to work, for your sort of misleading, for your deceptions to work, you kind of need a receptive audience. I don't think it's necessarily sufficient to just have power and the ability to manipulate people at least not in a liberal democracy. Of course, if we start talking about post-truth in autocracies, where the media is controlled, where other access to information are prohibited, such as in China, such as in Russia, such as in Turkmenistan, that's an example where the powerful elite can basically control what everyone else in the country listens to, reads about, hears about. But what are the interesting phenomena of post-truth in Britain, in America, and we can see other examples of it in Central Europe, in places like Hungary and Poland, is that the people kind of want to be lied to, I think. They want to have this vision of a different reality. They kind of want to enjoy the fantasy a little bit. And that's what really fascinates me about post-truth. I think sometimes the commentary suggests that post-truth is just a straightforward lie and that people are, are being taken in by that lie but I kind of think they want to. I think there's a little bit of a tango going on here and it takes two to tango. Anyway, another aspect of post-truth is in international relations. It's not just in domestic politics, but in the relations between countries via what could be described as uh, information control uh, and disinformation campaigns. The Russian government has been particularly closely associated with this in recent years, uh, having been identified by the US intelligence services in trying to influence the 2016 and the 2020 presidential and congressional elections. There is also uh, Cambridge Analytica that was utilizing Facebook to mislead people in the run up to the Brexit referendum. Uh, and. Again, this has potentially some international dimensions to it as well. So information is, as ever, a weapon of warfare. I mean, this is not terribly new. It's just that the scale of information exchange and therefore the scale by which we can misinform and disinform people is much quicker and much larger in scale. And another aspect of post-truth is insofar as it can lead to market manipulations as well. Uh, you know, celebrities can tweet about a particular stock and see it raise in value simply on the back of their perception of its value rather than its true value. Again, I'm afraid there's nothing particularly new about this. It's just that the potential scale in the internet age is so much greater. I mean, people talking up stocks in order to raise their value is as old as stocks themselves. But these days, Elon Musk can, can tweet about Dogecoin and see its value rocket as a mere consequence of that. And this links into what I was saying earlier about sometimes people kind of want to buy into the fantasy. I don't think it's as straightforward as saying that powerful people lie 
and less powerful people believe. I think the less powerful people sometimes know they're being lied to and they're kind of happy to go along with it. They're happy to enjoy the fantasy. In economics, for example, there's a concept known as the Tinkerbell effect. Now, this is in reference to J.M. Barry's classic Peter Pan and the character of Tinkerbell the fairy. In Peter Pan, if you say, I don't believe in fairies, then a fairy dies, according to Tinkerbell. And so you mustn't say, I don't believe in fairies. And economists have co-opted this to describe an effect wherein if people stop believing in the value of a commodity, an asset, whatever, its value will disappear. <laughs> that it's simply a matter of belief. It's not a matter of fact that the value inherent in Dogecoin, in Bitcoin, in all sorts of other commodities, products, you name it, can sometimes come down to sheer belief. The nature of the modern global economy is bound up in the sense of confidence, will, perception. Sure, there's some reality going on there. There's still some people actually making stuff and selling it and adding value to the economy. But a huge amount of it is just based on, do we think this is going to work out? And an example of this is the last global financial crisis in, in 2008, where the sudden shift in market perceptions basically tanked the world economy. And it wasn't because there was a, a material change in economics, because, or at least not that happened on the day before Lehman Brothers closed its doors and the, and the economies collapsed. But it was just a change in mindset. People all of a sudden realized that lots and lots of material changes over a long period of time might actually be really dangerous. And the party was over and the lights had been switched on and everyone suddenly freaked out and that's what caused the economy to tank. So the point I'm getting at is that actually politics, economics, sociology has for a very long time been shot through with not only facts, but also feelings. This is nothing new. What's new about it is the scale. It's, a, it's new by degree rather than in kind, I would argue. OK, so what is post-truth in a word? Is there a synonym for post-truth? It's really tricky because I think it does have so many different possibilities, different potentialities. I mean, some would just describe post-truth as straightforward lying, that it is someone who knows information and is deliberately withholding it. But in a case like Donald Trump, I'm not sure that he is necessarily lying. I mean, he's lying insofar as he's saying an untruth. But lying has a certain amount of intent assumed by it. You know, if you lie to someone, you know you're lying. I'm honestly not sure if Donald Trump does know he's lying. It's so difficult to tell. It's hard to imagine someone with that degree of conviction still being able to propagate a lie. Maybe he is possible, but... I haven't psychoanalyzed Donald Trump, so I just don't know. Anyway, lying kind of works as a synonym for post-truth. I think it's it's more than that. It's more interesting than that. So then there's misleading. You know, the red bus, the Brexit bus, that misled people. But it kind of misled people that wanted to be led away, led astray off the path of facts and reason and wanted to be led off into the more sort of dainty, joyous uh, arena of feelings and emotions. So <laughs> misleading, I think again, has this sense of a power imbalance that the powerful mislead the powerless. But sometimes the powerless are ready to go along with it, I would argue. Um, there's also deceiving, uh, you know, which you could argue is an, is an even more malicious uh, intent to, to withhold the truth or to tell a lie. And that's another thing to bear in mind that sometimes being uh, being deceitful doesn't mean to doesn't need to involve saying anything at all. You could deceive someone through failing to give them information that might be useful. And then you can talk about bias, you can talk about manipulation and so on. There's lots of very sort of interesting possible synonyms, but you think about it for yourself. Now, what about pre-truths? <laughs> now, I'm just playing around with the, the prefixes here, but you know, if we're talking about post-truth, then does that imply that there was an era of truthfulness and then some sort of era of pre-truthfulness? Well, I don't think so. I mean, again, I'm really open to hear your thoughts. I'm not sure, to be honest, but it seems to me, as I was mentioning earlier, that this is kind of as old as the hills. This is a quote from the uh, from Plato and the book Gorgias, uh, which was which was uh, completed in about 380 BC, so a very long time ago. And 
typical of Plato's books, it is presented as a dialogue, as a discourse, a conversation between Socrates, Plato's tutor, and Gorgias himself, who was a who was a visiting academic, if you like, from the island of Sicily. So Gorgias had come to uh, Athens and was having a chat with Socrates. Socrates in, uses the Socratic method, unsurprisingly, in Plato's books, where he basically fires off loads of difficult questions and the students try and answer them. So here he goes, he says, and the same holds of the relation of rhetoric to all other arts. The rhetorician need not know the truth about things. He has only to discover some way of persuading the ignorant that he has more knowledge than those who, those who know. Yes, Socrates, says Gorgias, and it is not and is not this a great comfort, not to have learned the other arts, but the art of rhetoric only, and yet to be in no way inferior to the professors of them. So what Socrates and Gorgias are getting at here is that basically silver-tongued persuasive people can effectively pretend to know more than people that actually know a lot about a given subject. And through that, they can obtain power. This was a recurring theme in the philosophy of Plato. Plato basically detested what would be described as sophists. Sophists were people that were very skilled at using rhetoric, very skilled at talking basically, but didn't feel the need to know an awful lot of stuff. Now, if this sounds familiar, that's because it's a good description of pretty much any politician you can think of, right? They don't necessarily have loads of expertise or technical knowledge, but they are very good at pulling together an argument, speaking in front of crowds, whipping people up and making them think that they know everything. So this is basically really freaking old. It's as old as politics itself. One reason that Plato was particularly disturbed by it was that he felt that this essentially meant that you had cacistocracy, which means the rule by the worst. So you've heard of democracy, but cacistocracy is ruled by the most inferior people. What Plato wanted was that philosophers like himself would basically be in charge of everything. Now, I don't know if any of you watched the Dominic Cummings interview on the BBC last night, but there were echoes of that in the interview then, where Cummings suggested that the problem with British politics is that we have these sort of amateur generalists that are in charge of the country, be they the politicians or the civil servants, and that, the, you know, the data heads that know the facts are shut out. But that's kind of how politics is done and always has been. And sure, there are flaws to that system, but it's nothing particularly new to that observation. And indeed, Plato observed the same thing. Plato indeed had a particularly, particularly personal grievance because his great tutor, Socrates, was put to death by the Athenian democracy for, mis, uh, for misleading the youth. So for, for his teaching, Socrates was killed. Uh, he had to take hemlock and he was killed for it. Um, so Plato was particularly embittered by this and I guess not unreasonably. Anyway, so this notion that there was some golden age of truthfulness when everyone respected experts and you know, <laughs> data and facts and objectivity was, on, was the only currency in town is for the birds. I'm afraid human beings have been misleading each other using post-truth long before the word was coined. To my mind, there ain't nothing new about this whatsoever. Anyway, what about truth? I mean, we've been dancing around this word for a while, but if we are discussing post-truth, then I suppose that presumes that we have a notion of what truth truth is. And that, of course, in itself is a very difficult concept to get our heads around. So this forms a branch of philosophical inquiry known as epistemology. Now, epistemology is the study of knowledge. Basically, if we say that there are objective facts, it begs the question of, well, how do we know that they are objective? How can we be so confident that they are in fact facts? Is it possible that the supposed facts are nothing of the sort? They are merely a delusion of the mind, that they are, I don't know, the, the current understanding of the enormous complexity of the universe, but our feeble brains are simply incapable, incapable 
of assessing true reality. We will never know the truth. We will only ever perceive a teensy wincy portion of it for ourselves. OK, and again, these debates about what is true, what is false, what is fact, what is fiction are as old as human civilization. Some of the earliest to contribute to this include Socrates himself with his famous dictum, the only thing I know for certain is that I know nothing at all, which in itself is a strong uh, statement of skepticism. Now, these days we understand skepticism as being disinclined to believe something. But a skeptic in the Greek philosophical tradition basically says there is no basis for absolute knowledge. So it's much stronger than, oh, I kind of I'm a bit skeptical. I'm not sure. No, no, no. A, a full on sort of Greek skeptic would say there is no truth. Nothing. Everything is relative. Everything is relative to your perception, to your surroundings, to the chemicals inside your bloodstream as a result of what you've been eating, smoking, drinking, etc. There is no truth. The only truth that I am aware of, according to Socrates, is that I know no truths, <laughs> which is kind of sort of depressing, but could be philosophically coherent. OK, um, there is an alternative which was, which was presented by the Stoics, also prominent in Greece, but later Rome, who would say that we do have access to some truths, but they are basically relative to our species. So as a result of our capacity to reason, we can generate certain axiomatic truths that are true in themselves, but they may not be true in the world. So for example, utilizing mathematics, we can say that two plus two equals four, and that is true. It doesn't mean that it's true in some sort of unbounded universal sense, but it's true within the parameters of human reason. And that's kind of the best you can ever hope for. So whatever stands for truth is true for human beings, but not for the universe. OK, uh, there's a famous Stoic philosopher called Epictetus who said what matters is not the things that happen, but the way that people think about those things. I, I've sort of garbled the quote, but the point is that it's not events, it's not actions, it's not it's not facts that matter, but it's how we deal with those facts. It's how we perceive them. It's how we think about them. OK, an example of this would be the old question. If a tree falls over in a forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? To the Stoics, the answer is easy. Of course, it doesn't make a freaking sound. How can a tree make a sound? Sound is just compressions of air, vibrations that sort of rattle around. There is no such thing as sound except for how that those vibrations are are adapted via our auditory canals into something that makes sense to our brains. There is no such thing as sound in the universe. There's only such thing as a sound for us in ourselves. So it's a simple question for a stoic. Of course, a tree doesn't make a freaking sound. It never has. Even if there is someone there, it doesn't make a sound. The tree doesn't make the sound. The human brain makes the sound. <laughs> and so this is a sort of philosophy that tends to make people go a little bit doolally because they start questioning everything around them. So trigger warning. All right. Just be careful. <laughs> this can be slightly alarming sometimes, but it's pretty cool and interesting. I think hopefully you, you agree. Anyway, um, Descartes. So we're romping forward in time, but a, a French soldier, mathematician and, and um, a philosopher called René Descartes came to the rescue of all skeptics in the 17th century, I think, uh, when he came up with his famous uh, dictum, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So what Descartes did was that he just went full bore on the skepticism. He said, right, okay, let's just doubt everything. Let's just doubt I have any existence. You know, I'm not looking at my hand. I can't see my feet. I can't I'm not seeing anything. Uh, you know, I am just a brain in a jar. I'm being manipulated by some evil demon who's making me see these thoughts and think these things and say these words and blah, blah, blah. It's all just fake. Everything's fake. Nothing's real. Nothing's true. What he came down upon was, well, hang on a minute. There is something going on here. I am still thinking. So even if my physical matter isn't real, the fact that I even have these thoughts suggests that there's something here. The fact that I'm thinking means that I exist in some non-trivial sense. And so hence, I think, therefore I am. 
The fact that I'm thinking means that I have some sort of existence. I may not exist in the way that I think I perceive myself. I may not have the long, luscious hair that Rene Descartes had, but that doesn't really matter. The key thing is that I'm thinking and therefore something, something exists. OK, so he kind of sort of clawed back something from the sceptical brink. He said, well, fine, we don't know anything for certain, but there's one thing I kind of do know for certain. OK, um, and there are others that have tried to come up with ways that we can talk about stuff that we know, stuff that are could be described as truths. And this is sometimes described as the tripartite uh, theory of knowledge which is that for you to know something, you need to have a justified true belief about it. So you may believe something to be true and your beliefs need to have some justification, meaning you have some reasons for, the, for your belief. So you can't just believe something to be true because of what you've been smoking. It needs to be accessible to public reason. And if it's also true, then it, that's knowledge. OK, so that could be a way to settle what is true versus what is false. For example, the results of the 2020 election. I believe that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. I have some justification in that belief because there is there are a lot of other people that have provided some quite useful evidence which solidifies my hunch, my belief that he won the 2020 election. And through sort of careful analysis of the votes, it seems to turn out that it is also true. So it is a justified true belief. Therefore, it is a fact that Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election. And you could use a similar methodology to describe, say, anthropogenic climate change, which is a fancy way of saying human caused climate change. There are various beliefs I have that climate change was caused by human beings. I feel I'm justified in those beliefs on a variety of bases, including the fact that the Milankovitch cycles that describe the progression from Ice Age to Ice Age have been disrupted over the past 100 years. And there seems to be some truths that have backed up these intuitions as well. So I feel like I have a justified true belief that climate change was caused by human intervention. OK, so we've got something to sort of found various other arguments on. We've got some sort of solidity to it. But along came a man called Edmund Gettier, who said that sometimes even if you have justified true beliefs, they could still be wrong. <laughs> and this is what's called a Gettier problem. Now, the example he gave was, let's imagine there are two people that are going for a job interview, Smith and Jones. And Smith is the person we're most interested in. Smith goes along for the job interview and the uh, company director says, oh, I'm sorry, Smith, we're, we're going to give the job to Jones. Just, you know, I mean, go through the interview, but heads up, we're giving it to Jones. So Smith knows or believes, sorry, that Jones is going to get the job, right? He also knows something else about Jones, which is that Jones happens to have 10 coins in his pockets. It's not particularly important how Smith knows that, but let's say they went for coffee earlier, they're, they're mates, they had a coffee together, and Smith saw that Jones put 10 coins in his pocket. So now Smith knows that the person that will be offered the job will have 10 coins in their pockets. OK, so he believes that the person that will get the job will have 10 coins in their pockets. And he's justified in that belief because the company director said, yeah, I'm going to hire Jones. What actually happens is that Jones has an absolute dog's breakfast of an interview, doesn't get the job, and Smith does get the job. And by coincidence, Smith has 10 coins in his pockets. So Smith's belief that the person that will get the job will have 10 coins in his pocket was true, but it was also simultaneously false because it was based on a false premise. Does this make sense? <laughs> now, a lot of people start thinking at this stage, oh my God, what is the point of this? This is such sort of classic philosophical navel gazing. We are getting nowhere. We're just talking about, oh, what do we know? Is the chair even real? Is, is there anything other than perception? And sure, you know, you might think it's it's little better than a sort of parlor game for privileged wankers like myself. <laughs> but there is a practical consequence to all of this, which is post-truth politics. And it is shaping the world. There are people out there who say, you can't say you're an expert. You can't tell me that I'm wrong just because I feel a certain way, because your objective facts 
are still subject to some doubt. And if they're subject to some doubt, then why do I have to listen to you? OK, so this all this whole sort of epistemology stuff can be pretty alienating. A lot of people find it just just unconscionably boring <laughs> and pointless. But it does, I would argue, have some real world significance and could potentially have even more so in the future. And I'll get to that a bit later. OK, um, some other sort of key protagonists to this debate in in Enlightenment thought would include David Hume on the left, pictured with his statue in Edinburgh. He was an empiricist, meaning that his basis for knowledge, as far as he was concerned, was the objects of the senses. So only stuff you could see, touch, measure was worthy of considered considering as real in any sort of sense. Uh, Immanuel Kant on the right believed that we actually can't assess the reality of objects in themselves. We can only know objects for us. So again, that's a bit like the tree falling in the forest. We can't know the sound of the tree because the sound is something inherent to us. That's the way we understand the trees falling and the, the ripples of air that it creates. But that's an entirely sort of inward perception. And so our entire existence is structured by the frameworks that we put on reality. We, in fact, therefore, just don't know reality. We have no access to reality. Reality is so complicated from the teeny weeny micro mini all the way to the enormous macro. We simply cannot fathom, understand, perceive anything about reality. So what we think we know about reality is all structured by these neural constructs. And uh, Kant described these as phenomena. These are things for us, whereas the noumena are things in themselves. And we will never know those things. OK, so these are sort of prominent thinkers and they've had a big impact on the scientific method. Now, OK, one of the classic mainstays for those that are looking for expertise is that they fall on scientists. Oh, we're following the science. That's what we're going to do in order to get out of the COVID-19 crisis. We will follow the science. But science doesn't give truths either. And this has long been known. Science tests hypotheses and it seeks rigorous methods for testing those hypotheses that are replicable and can be shared amongst the community. But what science cannot do and no good scientist would ever claim it could do is yield absolute indefeasible truths. OK, and there are a number of important philosophers of science that have contributed a great deal to this debate. Uh, one of whom is Karl Popper, who came up with this notion of falsifiability. What he said was that you can never prove a theory is true. You can only prove a theory is false. So trying to construct a scientific experiment that proves that you're right is a waste of time. The example he gave was that, you know, imagine you've got a theory that swans are white. And so you decide to set up a, a research design where you go out and you count white swans. So you, you go out to a park and you say, there's a white swan, there's a white swan, there's a white swan, oh, there's some more white swans. How many white swans do you have to count for your theory to be verified? There's obviously no number, right? You could keep counting to infinity white swans if you wanted to, but no particular point would there would you tip over from falsehood to truth. There's no, it would be so arbitrary to say, oh, once you've counted a million white swans, you're done. That's, that's good enough. That's a big effort. No, pointless. Popper said the best thing to do is not try and prove your theory is correct. Try and prove it wrong. Try and stress test it. Throw rocks at it. Because that's going to be way more efficient. So in Popper's swan analogy, he would say, don't bother trying to count white swans. Go and try and find a non-white swan. Try and prove yourself wrong. OK, and so what you would do, therefore, is hop on a flight, go to Australia, see a black swan, count one, and then you're done. Job done. I've disproved my theory that all swans are white. Nice. Easy. OK, but the upshot is that you cannot prove a theory is correct. You can only prove it is incorrect. And we're back to Socrates, therefore. The only thing I know with any certainty is that I don't know anything at all. And if you read a scientific paper, it will be shot through with those sorts of caveats. The, the, the authors will, will bend over backwards to say, well, we can't prove this, and there is need of more research here, and 
we've got some tentative evidence to reject the null hypothesis and we've got this, that and the other. We've got X probability likelihood that this is correct. You know, no scientist would ever publish if they said this is 100% fact. This is absolute. You cannot tell me I'm wrong. I've solved the mysteries of the universe. It just wouldn't happen because it wouldn't be science. <laughs> OK, um, on the right is a book by a man called Thomas Kuhn, who tried to describe the structure of scientific revolutions. And what he said is that science is, is quite faddish. It's quite trendy that there are certain sort of paradigms of scientific method, theory that predominate at particular points in time. And then along will come a particularly groundbreaking scientific uh, step forward and it will yield a paradigm shift. So the way everyone thought about science before will be ditched and the new paradigm will predominate. So some examples might include Darwinian uh, theories of evolution by natural selection. Prior to Darwin, there were certain approaches to zoology and botany but post-Darwin, it's all about Darwin. If you refer to anything that doesn't lead back to Darwin, then you are just considered a crank and no one's going to listen to you. So there was a, a big paradigm shift. There was another one with Einstein. And so the key thing for Kuhn is that, that scientists start to perceive a certain sense of what makes for good science. And it's only when that comes under extreme stress that a new paradigm might emerge. But the point is that, again, a lot of it comes down to perceptions. What we perceive of as good science depends on whether you're using the right terminology, whether you're referring to the right grounding theories, not whether or not your theory is in fact true or not. OK, so this is all a little bit disturbing that <laughs> we don't have any access to truth. Um, now, post-truth also owes a lot to what's called postmodernism. And um, so this is a really complicated matter, but broadly speaking, modernism was the consequence of the Enlightenment. So we had the Dark Ages and then the Enlightenment came along because it lit us up after the Dark Ages. And the Enlightenment uh, is typified by the scientific method and progresses in thought and, and so on. What supposedly was achieved in the modernist era was capacity to observe the truth. But what postmodernists would argue is that, that that was kind of bullshit, <laughs> to, to be a little bit demotic, that this notion that there was an era where we suddenly had access to truth suggests that, you know, the abuses that were, that were meted out against people, such as the Holocaust, such as the, the appalling misogyny, such as the homophobia, such as the racism, that they were all part of that modernist era and that they were somehow scientifically grounded. And indeed, of course, some scientists were co-opted in those appalling crimes. There were you know, uh, social Darwinists, for example, who claimed that as a result of Darwin's evolutionary theories, they could justify the mistreatment of people of colour, of women, of you name it. They could justify the euthanizing of disabled children. I mean, it's quite shocking, but supposedly that's what truth gets you. And postmodernists, therefore, are highly sceptical. If someone comes up to them and says, hey, hey I've got the truth, the postmodernist will say, no, you don't. And you're dangerous even saying that. That you claiming to have access to the truth when you don't have it is, in fact, ideological. It's not based on facts. What it's based on is a mindset. So again, a bit like how Immanuel Kant and earlier the Stoics would have it, you don't have access to truth. You do not have access to the real world. You have access to these neural constructs. And that's born out of your ideology and your upbringing and your surroundings and all of that sort of stuff. So what you claim as truth is in fact shot through with all of these sources of perception and some pretty classic uh, ideologies that form the narrative of our minds you know the stories we tell ourselves to make sense of this complicated reality would include things like uh, um, uh, lgbt uh, and um, and sexual orientation it would include of course gender uh, this book is called the second sex by simone de beauvoir it's a very important text in feminist politics 
I mean, she's a particularly good example of this scepticism. You know, there was rampant misogyny. There still is rampant misogyny and often justified in the name of nature, of science, of truth, of objectivity. Women ought to be denigrated because we know better, because we are stronger, because we have truth on our side. And hence, quite rightly, feminists and uh, people uh, who are sort of uh, not sort of norm, uh, no, uh, non-binary in their sexual orientation or, and so on, would would critique anyone who tries to claim this this degree of knowledge because they're using it as a weapon. They they don't have the knowledge. They're they're lying. Uh, there's also, of course, political ideologies uh, which divide people and gives them those little storytelling uh, motifs in their head. So, you know, to try and make sense of the complex world, they divide the world up into a democratic worldview or a Republican worldview, and then everything is slotted into that narrative construct. So they're not even interested in trying to perceive reality. They're trying to perceive the reality according to their political preferences. And of course, you probably anticipated this, but religion is an important way of structuring the way we think, uh, as is nationalism, as is internationalism and other forms of identity politics. So what's often going on in a public discourse, in a debate, is not an exchange of different facts and an argument over possible versions of the truth, but it's rather a clash of ideologies. It's a clash of worldviews. It's a clash of perceptions. And that can sometimes make it seem ironically a lot clearer as to what's going on. And again, it sort of leads to the conclusion that post-truth is n nothing new. It's, you know, it's been slightly supercharged by the internet, but it's basically all we've got given that we can't perceive absolute reality. So what's the future hold? Is there some post-post-truth? Is, is there some way that we can get beyond post-truth and start actually you know, dealing with objectivity and facts. Well, maybe one place to start would be to dump allusions to truth or even delusions to truth. This notion that people have access to facts or indeed alternative facts is just childish. Maybe we should all stop saying, well, I know the truth and you're wrong and I'm right and I've got facts and you've got lies. It's way too simplifying. Basically, we're all groping around in the dark so we'd be better off having a respectful conversation with people that disagree with us and try and start with a degree of intellectual humility. Given how complicated the world is, given how little we know for sure, I think it would be healthy for everyone to start by acknowledging that weakness, acknowledging that limitation. Uh, that's not targeted at anyone in particular. I'm not saying certain groups of people are particularly bad at this. I think almost everyone is quite bad at this. Uh, myself included, you know, in heated arguments with friends in a pub, you know, eventually I start thinking, hang on, do I really know this? Or am I just shouting it because I feel threatened, because I feel like my identity is under, under siege? So I think, you know, consensus, communication, discussion, it, we may not have access to objective reality, but I guess I'd be inclined to say, who cares? Fine. Yeah, we don't know for sure if uh, the tree is making a sound or if the chair I'm looking at right now actually exists. But what we do have is is intersubjectivity. So sometimes we say you've got objectivity or subjectivity. Objectivity meaning the absolute truth, facts. Subjectivity meaning utter opinion. You know, something that's totally personal to you. Intersubjectivity is somewhere in the middle. Basically, it's where we all agree to get along. We try and work out some way of moving forward via consensus. And I think having those conversations to try and reach some points of consensus is going to be the way to move forward. And there are some examples like climate change. I think climate change is a prime example where there have been quite reasonable discussions about the validity of certain scientific methods. But the evidence and the theory is so overwhelming that it kind of doesn't matter anymore if we still harp on about, well, we don't know the objective truth. We don't know precisely what will happen if there is a one and a half degree temperature rise. For God's sake, we know enough that we might as well just get on and do something about it. So I think climate change is a good example of how through 
sustained debate, we have finally got to a position where we can do something about it. And I think that that could be a model for how we move forward, albeit it took a bloody long time with climate change. Anyway, so maybe we should dump this notion of truth and post-truth because it's kind of insulting everyone's intelligence because we don't know anything. <laughs> um, there's also a potential threat, which is that, of course, information is only going to become more and more powerful. And what we're seeing now in the information age with globalization and the internet is how powerful flows of information across borders are now. But imagine what it's going to be like when we've got quantum computers. You know, this is the, the information age. And so the control and the dissemination of data and information is going to become more and more powerful. And there are some uh, countries and governments that have, I would say, a very poor record on how they control and disseminate information, that they are leaning in to controlling what information their peoples have access to, and therefore denying the possibility that we could reach a consensus through open discussion by not even allowing that to happen in the first place. Now, I should note, of course, that it may look a bit, uh, I don't know, superior of a, of a Brit to have the flags of America, China and India there. You know, Britain is just as guilty as any other government in controlling information and misusing it. So what I'm getting at here is that those three countries are the future. By 2050, they will be the largest powers and they will be vying with Africa for, for, the, for the geopolitical dominance. And therefore, we will have to hope that those countries have some respect for this, the importance of intersubjectivity. But I guess what I'm seeing at the moment doesn't fill me with a huge amount of confidence on that score. Anyway, I don't want to depress you too much.